Well, Jim Paolo, before you start, um, normally we've, uh, the meeting usually starts at seven, and I know there are going to be a few people who are going to start joining. So we're going to have more people joining the meeting in the next two to three minutes. Um, but I know everybody is very excited that you're here. I see Mike Puckett's online too. But I, mm -hmm. um, we were going to have you speak first. Um, we've got a nice group of people here who are very excited SolidWorks users. And they're interested in hearing from you about your perspective about where you think SOLIDWORKS is going and the future of SOLIDWORKS and what we can expect in the next year or two um, and what kind of skills you think um, these attendees might need to be valid, you know, to be meaningful um, in the job market. And so um, we're a little past seven, so, and I know you're a very, very busy man. So I'm going to let you talk. Okay, thank you, Elise. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I I have prepared a few slides, and uh, yeah, I would like to talk about the strategy. I would like to talk about uh, the job market and uh, how SolidWorks can help uh, students and engineers uh, all over the world uh, to become uh, uh, powerful designers to to empower them to really uh, express their their ideas and and make an impact in the work in the workplace um, now let me try to share my screen if you don't mind Do you you guys have uh, yeah everybody's on uh, everybody's on zoom i guess so let me share the screen okay and let me go in presentation mode and you tell me if you see my screen. Yes, it looks perfect. Okay. Yep, yep, okay. we can see it. Very good. So I guess I, I get started. Um, I'd like to make this as uh, interactive as, uh, as, as you want. You can, anybody can interrupt me. If uh, something that I say is not clear, I'm happy to elaborate or to explain better, okay? So let's see how it works. Let me start. Uh, I also have a few videos. I hope they go through nice, nicely through Zoom. Sometimes there is some lag. Do you see the video? Okay, I hope so. Yeah, we're seeing, anyway, we're seeing it. Yeah. okay. So you know this little robot uh, is called Baxter, and uh, it is powered by artificial intelligence. It's actually called a cobot. Uh, created by a company in Boston called Rethink Robotics. And it is designed to work in cooperation with humans. And they tell you why I, I show you this type, this particular device. Now I want to show you another one. Here is another robot. It's called uh, Kubo. Uh, and uh, was designed by Tim Keist. And uh, it... KAIST is a small university in South Korea, and this robot was the winner of the DARPA Robotics Challenge Finals on June 6, 2015. Uh, this machine is an adaptable, multifunctional device that is able to transform from a walking robot to rolling on four wheels, as you can see, by bending and using uh, the wheels that are incorporated into its knees. One of the tasks was also to climb stairs, as you can see, which the Hubo was able to do by transforming into its working uh, posture. So small, uh, small universities, they won a $2 million prize in 2015. This competition was inspired by the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan, where uh, people were not able to go into the plant, into the damaged plant to do simple things like uh, turning off, uh, uh, shut shutting off a valve, or uh, simple things like those. And uh, as you can see, a robot like Hubo was able to do all these things. Let me show you another thing. So this is Boom. This is a company uh, in California. 
and uh, their mission is uh, to put uh, in place uh, to create uh, a supersonic uh, uh, airplane for commercial for commercial flights so basically they want to put back in business uh, a glorious uh, experiment that was done uh, in the 70s it was called uh, it, it was a concord it was a joint uh, work of uh, british uh, aerospace and uh, and air france um, now they had to decommission it because it was too costly at some point it was dangerous was very noisy very polluting, uh, not very comfortable. But now with the development of the uh, jet uh, technology, new materials, uh, this small team of people, 20 people, uh, think that they can resuscitate as a dream of the Concorde. And basically, to create an airplane that at the cost of a regular uh, business flight uh, seat can fly you from New York to London in less than three hours. So now, what, uh, why did I show you these three things? What, what do these things uh, have in common? So first of all, these products could not have been produced uh, just a couple of decades ago. In a way, they are the result of uh, a deep transformation that industry, society, and technology are undergoing. So these are extraordinary devices that incorporate multiple design disciplines and work as systems. They've been created in a relatively little time by small visionary companies or teams. And the third, the third thing that they have in common, they have all been designed, simulated, and manufactured with the tools that the company I work for develops and sells. SolidWorks. So, in a way, system and system of systems are the, are the future of design. Uh, you cannot create robots, you cannot create uh, uh, supersonic flights unless you put, you put together multiple disciplines. Everything that has to do with sensors, with vision systems, with feedback loops, with the electrical system and electronic, together with the superior mechanisms. So all these things are extremely important, and I know that you guys that are part of the LANE College uh, are, uh, are studying these days. So all these multiple disciplines are extremely important for your career, because there is no device that you will be creating in the future that doesn't have electronics or electrical systems. Okay? Okay, now let me switch uh, to SolidWorks. The system, the tools that help these amazing companies, all startups, by the way, very small companies. Keist University is very small, probably smaller than Lanai. I visited that, that uh, university three years back, very small. Um, but but uh, again, very, very imaginative. Imagination, there is no limit to imagination these days. And what you can do, if you are empowered by the right technology, Anybody can do anything, including a supersonic jet. So SolidWorks uh, today is, is a tool that is uh, quite accepted in the marketplace, uh, in, uh, in the mechanical world. It's becoming some sort of standard. Today, uh, we have uh, taught uh, about 10 million students in the 24 years uh, of, our, uh, of our history. And today, we believe that there are 5 million users still using working every day on our tools, including uh, educational, uh, educational licenses, like the ones that uh, you have been using now. Uh, we are today in uh, more than 300,000 companies, so this, these numbers are harder to keep up because we add about uh, 20,000 new companies every year, and uh, we sell about 70, 80, 80,000 new seats of SolidWorks. Uh, we are very, very happy that uh, uh, SolidWorks is being taught in academic uh, institutions. Actually, more than 33,000 schools around the world teach uh, SolidWorks. Not only teach, not only SolidWorks is part uh, of the curriculum, but is also taught and used in the labs, in the research labs, that is basically where the future is invented. But you're also very much present in, uh, in, in the new 
in new uh, outfits that are uh, the modern way of making things. As you know, the Fab Labs, for instance, the Fab Lab, which is a spin-off of the MIT, um, we are founding members. And uh, every year we help uh, the Fab Lab Foundation to create a new lab in uh, some remote part of the world. We have decided uh, to sponsor labs uh, in the most uh, remote places. One was, uh, the first one was in Rwanda, Central Africa, the first uh, Fab Lab in Central Africa. And then uh, the following year, we did one in Nepal. And then we did one uh, in uh, Patagonia, the southernmost uh, tip of South America. So why do we do these things? Be because uh, because uh, we believe that uh, science and technology can really change a society. And again, we believe that uh, if we empower people with the right tools and most importantly, with the right knowledge, there is nothing that they can achieve for themselves. And uh, we are also inspired by the desire of uh, some of these uh, countries like Bhutan uh, to create a circular economy. Basically, they want to produce locally what they consume locally, uh, which is something that these days, these days is becoming very valuable. So these skills of nations to produce locally what they consume locally is very, very uh, precious these days because, uh, because of sustainability in general, but also because uh, this could help uh, weather a crisis or disruptions of the supply chains that, as we can see, are very easy to happen these days, even with all our progress uh, and our science and technology. Of course, we are present in incubator and accelerators. We wanted to inspire the innovators of the future, the, the startup that will fuel the economy in the future. We want to be there, early adoption. We like to be there. And uh, our dedication to education is also testified by our work and investment in certification. And Mike will, uh, will talk about that. Mike uh, is, uh, is, is directing our certification program since many years. And for us, it's an extremely important, uh, an extremely important activity. Why? Because it helps keep uh, students and employees uh, up to date with the capability that our software gives them. In a way, empowers them to uh, use uh, their imagination the best with the help with the, of our tools. And then we have uh, presence in the social media and, and so on. As, as uh, you know, it is a, the modern way uh, to let the world know what we do and uh, what, uh, what we think about. We are present in 11 industries, uh, from transportation to business services, and uh, including uh, uh, architecture, construction, cities, and territory. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, probably if you, if you look around in, in, your, uh, in, in a building, in a commercial building, or even uh, in a, in a domestic, in a residential house, everything that goes in a building probably has been designed with solid walls. All the curtain systems, the window systems, the, the shells uh, of the iconic uh, buildings that you see around the world. You know that uh, the Louis Vuitton Museum in Paris, a marvel of uh, design and engineering, uh, architectural design, has been manufactured, uh, designed and manufactured using solid walls as uh, many other iconic buildings all over the world. You, probably you don't know that uh, uh, in Dubai, uh, one of the, I mean, most of the most iconic uh, uh, buildings uh, back there, the shell, the external cladding of the building has been designed and manufactured using solid walls by a company called Al Abar, which is a vertical integrated company in, uh, in Dubai. They go uh, from the production of uh, aluminum all the way into the production of, uh, of the panels, of the panels uh, that constitute uh, the cladding, the curtain systems that go outside of the buildings. But our uh, industry number one is industrial equipment, followed by high tech, and then uh, business services and engineering services. But we have a very strong presence in each and every one of these industries. So basically, wherever your career will bring you, uh, very likely the skills that you use today will be very, very useful. So, and this is also another important point because at the end you spend the time, precious time, which is probably the most important investment of your life, your time, the time that you dedicate to studying. 
So I think I have good news for you because you are spending time studying a tool that is very much widespread. The, the, the blue curve that you see in these diagrams represent uh, uh, on the left side of uh, this slide, they represented the new license volume by brand in the last, uh, actually, what is it, more than 10 years. So the statistics are until mid-19. The next, uh, the next calculation done by these analysts will be done uh, probably in the next couple of months. So um, we, this shows uh, what I told you before. We sell every year about 70, between 70 and 80,000 new seats uh, of uh, solid work. And on the right side of this chart, you see the cumulative licenses that we have sold. And uh, as you can see, this, these are only commercial licenses. So this does not include, uh, include the education. So in fact, last year, we reached the million, millionth sold commercial license. And again, this put us ahead of the competition, which of course, from a pure commercial point of view, is a good, uh, is a good point, is a good data point, good data point. But uh, for what concerns you, uh, the point here is that uh, knowing SolidWorks gives you an advantage in the marketplace, because guess what? Many industries, this chart show that our market, uh, market share is about 50%. So you have 50% chances that you find uh, in your career, you find a job in an industry that uh, use uh, SolidWorks as a primary design tool and, and, uh, and, uh, and various other tools from our portfolio. So as mechanical engineers, uh, this shows uh, an interesting uh, distribution of, of the market, of, uh, of the job market. This is, uh, the, this is, these, these are data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, updated uh, uh, until last May. Again, they updated it once a year. But this shows what are the hot areas for employment. As you can see, the darker the area, the more uh, employment opportunities you can, uh, you can see. So you see here in, uh, in the Michigan area, around the Great Lakes, uh, uh, California, Washington, Texas, Florida. You see the dark, uh, the dark green areas are places with, with a very high employment rate for mechanical engineers. But as you can see, there is green everywhere here in the US. So it is definitely a good profession to be in. And if you look at this, uh, this is the annual mean wage. So this means, uh, this is pretty, pretty amazing because uh, mean means, it means that it's in the middle. So half of the salaries are above and half of the salaries are below. And you can see the dark blue areas are areas where the mean wage is between 90 and $125,000 a year. So congratulations, I think you, uh, you are betting your career in a safe place. So it is a good place to be, to be a mechanical engineer. So I would like now to switch. So basically, congratulations again. You, you made the right career choice going to this college and deciding to uh, dedicate your future to engineering. I think it was, uh, it was wise. I am actually encouraging also my kids to do that. And my son is about to go to an engineering school here in, uh, here in Boston. Um, but the question is, uh, what, uh, what do we do here at SolidWorks to deserve the numbers that I show you to be, why are we the market leader and why we have uh, 5 million users uh, around the world? I mean, the competition is strong. The, 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 the options are out there. Um, and I like to, to discuss uh, the reasons of, uh, of our presence in the mechanical world under three categories. We believe that it's all related to our values. And you know, the values of a company don't change in time. I think we are still anchored to the founding values that I will explain what they are. And then, of course, we need to have a vision. And to that, tonight, I wanted to communicate to, to, to you what is our vision. And then, very importantly, we need to have a strategy. So what do we do according to our values to realize our vision. So let's start uh, with the values. I want to go this uh, very, very to this very quickly. So first of all, we believe in inspiring people. We believe in the democratization of technology. 
And here are some pictures of the Fab Lab that we founded around the world. As, as I told you, we truly believe that, that technology can change communities, can change a society. And I don't know if you know the history of Rwanda. Rwanda went through a terrible civil war uh, you know, in the last century, so not long ago. A lot of young people have terrible memories of those times. But uh, they decided to turn the chapter, to dedicate their life to thinking about the future. They will not forget, but they will forgive. This is what they want to do. And it is truly inspiring, you know, because uh, what happened there is really sad, but these guys have decided to pacify, to just look at the future, remember the past, forgive everybody that was uh, responsible for what happened, and just move on. And they want really to invest a lot into science and technology. And we are so proud to be there. We go there. Mike, Mike is a frequent visitor of, of Rwanda. He's, uh, he's uh, teaching, he's coaching as a, a teacher of colleges. He's, he's coaching uh, startups, uh, the Fab Lab itself. So good work is happening in this part of the world. And uh, as you can see in the picture here, you see that uh, the tall person, uh, you know, under the A of Fab Lab, he's Tony Blair, the former prime minister of UK. So during the inauguration of the Fab Lab in Rwanda, there was uh, the World Economic Forum for uh, Africa happening in, uh, in uh, Kingali, the capital of Rwanda. And all these uh, uh, politicians and dignitaries from all over the world, they came to visit the Fab Lab because they saw so much excitement. And uh, a few years after, I can really tell you that uh, this is uh, uh, you know, inspiring a lot of people to create uh, uh, new companies to create startup uh, to build uh, their own future, to not depend from uh, the outside world to make uh, to build their progress. Same story, similar in Bhutan. Can you imagine that in Bhutan, uh, uh, it is a kingdom. It is a very small country, very beautiful, uh, nested uh, in the north of in the Himalayas, north of uh, of India, and they even have a ministry for gross uh, domestic happiness. So they measure gross domestic product as the rest of us. But they wanted to make sure that this does not compromise the happiness of the people. We find this uh, very inspiring. And then we work with kids. Look at the young lady on the right of the screen. Look, uh, look at how she, she interacts with the laptop. She doesn't even touch the mouse, you know. These kids are used to touch a type of controls and interaction. So we truly believe that they inspire us. The way they interact with technology, the way we think, the way they think, inspire us to create better tools for this type of generation. So these are part of our values. Education, I already said how important is the education. We are so proud to be in 83% of the top university was worldwide, including, of course, the Lanay College. And do you know Lanay College was the first college that I visited as soon as I Became, became in 2011 an employee of SolidWorks. So I've been working for the so for many years, but in 2011, I moved to Boston and I became the VP of R&D of SolidWorks. And Elise invited me for, uh, at a user group like this one tonight uh, in, in California. It was my first uh, outing, so to speak, as vice president of uh, research and development uh, of uh, SolidWorks. It was uh, May 2012. We, as I said, we are, uh, we follow incubators, accelerators, we like uh, the startups. As a matter of fact, uh, if any of you is interested in creating uh, the next disruptive uh, st uh, startup, uh, I can tell you that we will give you all the tools that you need to be successful. We are today sponsoring over 4,000 startups all over the world. And, uh, and we process about a couple of hundred applications every month. Really a very successful program. And it is part of our value. And of course, uh, part of our values is our dedication to the communities. Uh, in fact, uh, this user group is one among uh, more than 200, thousands of meetings all over the place. And we try to be there as much uh, as we can. And most in person. I, I personally like uh, to go travel and see, visit, uh, participate in these, meet in these meetings, uh, talk to people, understand what are their needs. Uh, what are their problems, uh, and, and so on. Again, this is part of our values. Now, 
let's talk about vision. Let's talk about the future of design. So Elise uh, asked me at the beginning uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, of this uh, conversation tonight, she asked me, okay, tell us what's coming in SOLIDWORKS. Well, very well, I will, I will tell you exactly what is coming, but I tell you what are the foundations of our product development. Why we believe that the future of design is going, is going in a certain direction and what are we doing? So to be very practical, we think that the future of design goes in, okay, uh, this was too fast, let me go back one slide. Okay, they want to run the animation. Just give me a second. All right. There is some lag. Okay, I hope you can see this uh, beautiful animation done with the uh, composer, by the way. So the future of design rests on uh, three foundations. Okay, foundation number one, and I want to explain to you what are these, what is the foundation of the future of design? What are uh, the directions, the stream, that inspires the development in our R&D lab, research and development lab. First of all, we believe that the future of design is multidiscipline. okay? This was the first thing I said tonight when I was explaining robots and, and supersonic jets. Those things are systems. Those things are not made out of, a, of an individual discipline. Those are multiple disciplines working harmoniously together. And basically, the future of design is founded also on the concept of integration. What does it mean, integration? It means that you don't want to have digital discontinuity between the mechanical discipline, electrical, electronics, and everything else that goes before, after, and in between. So there are multiple disciplines. Later, I will explain also that we have multi-physics. And then we have even, we go all the way into material science. So engineering today is becoming more and more sophisticated. And uh, multiple disciplines is one of the foundations of modern design. So putting together all those disciplines in a continuous digital environment, I think is very, very important. And this is what we are doing. So basically everything that we do is integrated. Whether you do schematics for uh, a PCB, a, pr a printed circuit board, or you do schematics for uh, an electrical uh, design, then you want to click a button and see from the schematic, which is the logic of your uh, equipment, go all the way into the physical, physicality of your equipment. So all, uh, all the sensors, all the relay, all the switches, all the transistors, you want to see those physically in their 3D uh, representation. So from schematics, the logic, all the way to the physical. Again, multiple disciplines all together. This includes also manufacturing, the discipline of manufacturing. This has to be seamlessly connected to the world of design. What you can see here is a SOLIDWORKS CAM. SOLIDWORKS CAM is tightly integrated with SOLIDWORKS. You click on a button and you are able to get your uh, uh, toolpath. You don't need to be a super expert of C code. You don't even need to read the C code. You click on a button, you define some strategy, and you are able to see what is the consequence from a manufacturing point of view of your design decisions. For instance, should you decide to put a manufacturing feature on one face of the subject or on another one, it may require jigs, it may require repositioning, it may require a sequence of operations that can bring the cost of your product way up. Guess what? With this software, we can, you can simulate that. You can see how many tool changes you have to do. You can see how long will it take to cut this, this piece of metal and whether there are different options. So you can do a design of experiment. You can experiment the consequences of your design decision all the way into manufacturing. So you don't, wait, you don't want to wait until a grumpy uh, a grumpy te technician from the shop floor comes up and tells you, hey, young engineer, this is not a good design. This is not a good decision. It's going to be too costly to manufacture your little piece of metal. Okay? So in the integration of all of this, of all these disciplines, will allow you to simulate, to design precisely, 
to figure out whether they, for instance, a printed circuit board has enough room, has enough cooling, there is no intersection with the mechanical case. Remember the disaster of the Galaxy Notebook. Maybe, maybe you are too young to remember. But a few years back, the Galaxy, a version of the Galaxy Notebook had a problem, a, you know, a design problem. So in some versions of the notebook, one uh, condenser was colliding with the metal case. Sparks were happening and the battery would uh, go on fire. So that was a $2 billion mistake. Now I think it would, it would have been much better for uh, the companies that designed the Samsung Galaxy to spend a little money for software to integrate the design of the circuit board with the design of the metal casing to avoid a mistake like this and figure out that the distance was too short or that there was a, a collision and spark could have happened. Let me go to the second, uh, to the second uh, uh, pillar of uh, the future of design and it's called automation. So we strongly believe that automation is not only about robots, uh, you know, doing assembly operations or manufacturing operation. We believe that automation extends as well to the world of design. And I want to show you a couple of examples. So look at this one. I hope the video comes uh, down correctly. So here the designer uh, selects uh, a wheel and you, all of you have immediately understood that what you want to do now is to assemble the wheels into the legs of this chair. And since I believe you are uh, proficient uh, SOLIDWORKS users, you know very well that this operation is very tedious. It takes a lot of time. You have to do a lot of clicks. You have to create uh, all the right mates, at least, uh, two, at least two mates per wheel. And then you have to move the camera to make sure that you can select the cylindrical faces. You can say that you have to be partial and then you have to select a flat face to be flush with in order to exhaust all the degrees of freedom. To make a long story short, an operation is simple that a kid, a five year old kid can figure out, you know, it takes a lot of time to, a, to a, an advanced engineer like you. So we thought, why can we not invent an algorithm, a machine that can guess what type of assembly operation you want to do here. And by the way, if you work in the furniture industry, probably you have done this type of operation already. Maybe this is not your first office chair. So in other words, there is a technology called machine learning, which is a branch of artificial intelligence that can go into your database and figure out if there is something similar. It can learn. That is why it is called machine learning. It can learn from the past of your design operation. And it can recommend you the next design operations. So we are introducing a lot of these technique, techniques based on machine learning. Uh, I have announced uh, a few at the 3D Experience World back in uh, Nashville. Uh, you know, Elise was there as well. So for instance, uh, operations to simplify the creation of sketches, again, based on the previous patterns, or uh, the creation of fillet and chamfers, which are operations very, very common on mechanical objects. And we strongly believe that uh, algorithms, artificial intelligent algorithms, can definitely be smart enough uh, to relieve you from some of these operations. We call this an assistive uh, type uh, of, uh, of automation, right? It basically assists you. It's not super intelligent, you know, but, you know, it can relieve you from a lot of clicks that don't add a lot of value. Let me show you another type of, uh, of automation. Uh, we call this uh, generative automation. This is uh, quite uh, more advanced. Here, the machine is asked to recommend the shape for the swing arm of a motorcycle. And the only input here has been uh, the constraints, basically, connect the, um, the frame of the motorcycle to the rear wheel and just keep out from the, from the chain, from the, from the powertrain. 
And look at what uh, the computer came up with in about 10 minutes of computation. Here is a, a little bit accelerated. What struck me is that it came out with an asymmetric swing arm. Now, if you are a motorcycle riders, uh, I am one. If you are a motorcycle riders, you understand that today many motorcycles have asymmetric swing arms. But this was not the case a few years back. For many, many years, as the motorcycle industry focused on creating symmetric swing arms. Why? Because a symmetric swing arm is uh, very close to the way of thinking of humans. Humans like symmetry. But this one is lighter and stiffer. So it is a better mechanical object. And only through a technology called the optimization and generative, the computer was able to recommend this shape. Now, of course, this is not the final design, but just, just a design like this is going to teach something to an engineer. It's going to teach that a shape like this is probably the best performing mechanical object for a given task. So engineers with a tool like this can free up their time to do design of experiments, so to try different possibilities and spend more time in what? In articulating the mechanical problem. Computers cannot define the problems on themselves, you know? Computers are very stupid. They can only answer questions. This was actually what Picasso said 50 years ago. He said, I'm not interested in computers, you know? They can only answer questions. And actually, this is a very profound statement because uh, if you cannot formulate the right questions, it is true, computers are useless. Computers are very good at answers, answering very, very, com very complicated computational problems, solving computational problems. But if you do not formulate the problems, the computers are completely useless. So this technology, this, uh, auto this type of automation is called the generative. There is another, the third type of, of, uh, auto, of uh, uh, the third type of foundation of the future of design, and it is simulation. I think all of you understand what the simulation is, but I want to tell you that the simulation extend uh, into multi-physics. It's not only stress and strain, probably the most common form of simulation that you guys know. It's not about uh, uh, structural. But it's also about the fluid. It's also about uh, the. It's also about acoustic, for instance, or lighting simulation, heat transmission, uh, any type of fluidic, turbulent, laminar. So any type of physical phenomenon that you can see around you today can be simulated. And the future of design, every single thing that can interact with your object in the most realistic way can and should be simulated, all the way into simulating manufacturing processes. The picture here on the top left is exactly the simulation of sintering, 3D printing of metal. Today, as you probably know, 3D printing is uh, extremely uh, complex and costly. And uh, you know, if uh, there is a, a lot of heat generated when the 3D printing metal, and if you don't do the right uh, shape the right balance between material and the heat and the speed, uh, your, job, your job can be destroyed at the end because of residual thermal stress. Okay? All of this can be simulated today. Okay, so let's go to the strategy. I, I think, I hope I have explained to you what is our vision of the future, what is our strong conviction that uh, you know, the future of design rests on integration, on automation, and on simulation. So how do we put this in practice? What are the actions that we take? What are the type of products that we wanted to give engineers like you to do your job? So in short, our strategy is, uh, is based on expanding the portfolio, okay? Expanding the portfolio to multiple disciplines. As I said, Today, design is deeply multidisciplinary. So you have to do elect electrical, you have to do electronics, you have to do mechanics, you have to do, you have to do manufacturing, you can simulate and factoring manufacturing. You know, there is an entire discipline 
called design for manufacturing, okay? And a lot of simulation. So we need to dramatically expand our portfolio. This is what we are doing. And the name of this new portfolio is called the 3D Experience Works. Okay, this is a commercial detail that probably is not interesting for you. What is interesting is that we are using a cloud technology to do that. Why so? Well, because the cloud, because cloud technology, the internet is infinitely scalable. Okay, so we believe that the amount of disciplines that we have to put together is so large that it cannot be delivered on, on, on a laptop not all together. So what we want to make available to everybody are individual applications that can be consumed on demand and used and don't, need, don't even need an installation. And I will explain, I will show some of you. So the idea is to do something like, to have a platform like, you know, like an iPad, the iOS, the operating system of Apple is in a way a platform, right? And you go on the internet and you basically download the, only the app that you need to use. Or you even use a browser on the iPad to do many of the functions that you need to do. You don't even need the, sometimes to, to even install an app on your, on your iOS. But even if you install the app, this is a seamless. It's very painless. All the data model update, is update itself. All the, all the data update, update themselves. So if you have videos, and if you have a video app, when you update the video app, all the videos are compatible. You don't even realize that these updates happen, you know? So we want to, to have a system that works like this. And this is the, uh, the picture that represented the architecture. So basically, the, the bottom la layer are what we call the operating system, just like uh, the iOS on an iPad. is where all the applications that are represented by these columns the columns are represent a different family of applications, is, is, is where all these applications can be uh, deployed and where they find commonality. They, com they find integration. Because today, you can take a picture on, uh, on your, just to make the analogy of the, of the iPad, of the iPhone. You can take a picture, then you can take a picture and post your picture in Instagram, and then you can take uh, a text from, uh, uh, from the internet that you can uh, paste uh, into, into a, a mobile version of Word or Google Docs and so on. Everything is beautifully integrated. As long as it, is, uh, it plugs into a common platform. In the case of the iPad, the platform is called iOS. In our situations, the platform is called 3D Experience Platform. Okay? So I want to show you some of these applications that run in a browser. Let me show you one here. This is called uh, 3D Creator, that, and the application, 3D Creator is a, a product that includes uh, several applications, and one, like for instance, translators and stuff like that, but the most interesting application of, uh, of this product called 3D Creator is uh, called X-Design. As you can see, this runs in an iPad. Uh, in fact, I choose, a, you know, I selected the iPad as, as an analogy, not uh, by accident, because we believe that a lot of operations today can be done on mobile devices and actually should be done on mobile, mobile devices, including the design of objects, as you can see here on, uh, on this video. So this X design runs in a browser. It is fully compatible with, your, uh, with the solid walls that you know today. The only difference is that here, you don't need to install anything. It can run on an iPad. You don't need a Windows computer. You just need a browser. You can do it on a Mac. You can do it on a Chromebook. You can do it on any connected browser. The only difference is that you need to be connected to the internet, okay? Let me show you another example. And show, this shows the integration also with SOLIDWORKS. All of this, as I said, is fully integrated. Now, this application is very good to design organic shapes. It is called the 3D Sculpture. Just because, uh, you know, operating with this product is like sculpting, uh, sculpting uh, clay, modeling clay. And uh, as you can see, it's very simple to create organic objects. And look at that. Now that shape can be brought into SOLIDWORKS, the SOLIDWORKS that you know, seamlessly. And from there, you can run uh, the simple injection molding simulation. I don't know if you use this product, but uh, it is part of our portfolio. Then you can simulate uh, the manufacturing and the equipment for the injection molding. 
So again, all integrated, all simulated, all automated. Let's go and talk a little bit more about, uh, um, about simulation. Here is a very simple object, okay? What is this? This is a clip that you probably find in your bicycle. Now, you have to understand that to design correctly this clip is not easy. It's not easy to find a clip that never fails and that can be operated uh, thousands of times. But probably you know that if your saddle becomes loose, well, that's not a good riding, riding experience, especially if you are on a downhill ride or something like that, right? So to design correctly a clip like this, it takes a, a lot of science because the displacement are at the limit of non-linearity because the, 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 you know, the bar of the clip stretches a lot. And then you have to factor in the friction, the contact, the deformation of the external pipe. So a lot of stuff to do it correctly. Not to mention the little example on the right of, of the screen where you simulate the, you know, a brick that falls on, on a can, on a tin can. Well, it takes a lot of science and technology to simulate squeezing a can very, very precisely. You may wonder why do you need to do that? Well, uh, you know, some recycling equipment do sque can squeezing all the time. So you'd better figure out what are the forces that are needed and whether your equipment is effective or not, all right? You can do all of this with the simulation. In the platform, you find uh, in our portfolio an application called Structural Professional Engineer, runs in the cloud, so you don't have to install uh, very sophisticated computers that need a lot of computational power because to do Non-linear analysis, keep this in mind, non-linear analysis, it will become a, an important part of your curriculum, I am pretty sure. Today, a lot of problems, everything that has to do with large deformation, everything that has to do with uh, uh, crash test, drop test, uh, plastic deformation, rubber, all those things are called non-linear simulation problems. And they are computationally very, very intensive. That's why Cloud technology can help because on the cloud you can rent uh, as many CPUs and GPUs that are uh, computational units that you need. Now let me show you something else. This is a, an amazing picture of uh, the simulation of uh, a, a, a jet fighter interaction with the, the most common of the fluids, which is the air. Okay, this is non-laminar turbulence. It's turbulence interaction. And the forces that are generated by this interaction are extremely complex, okay? And uh, today, especially in aerospace, to get this right, to, make, to be able also to predict, for instance, fuel consumption and lifting capability and stability of the aircraft is extremely important. So fluid dynamic is uh, a, an increasingly important part of the curriculum of any engineer. Continuing on, the, uh, you know, on showing uh, the various disciplines that are part of uh, the engineer of the mechanical engineering world. Here is, for instance, the simulation of the electromagnetic field. This is very important. Why is it important for a mechanical engineer? Because a mechanical engineer probably has to design uh, uh, consumer products like this watch here that you can see. Now. Then you have to make decisions like where do I place my antenna? Because today all the modern watch, watches are uh, connected. They connect to the Wi-Fi, they connect to the GPS towers. And uh, you have to understand that the, the location of the antenna is critical for the performance of uh, these connected objects. And you'd better simulate what happens when you wear those objects. Because do you know that, did you know that the body, the human body can work as an antenna? So as long as you know that uh, you know, the object that you are designing is wearable, and as long as you know where it is going to be put, you can probably simulate the interaction of the human body in the functioning of the electronics. Extremely important. And of course, again, I wanted to insist uh, on this concept of uh, multi-physics. Multi-physics is, is, will be part 
of your daily job. I want to, to just uh, make an example, okay? I want to show you what it takes to have a successful 3D printing strategy. So 3D printing, a special, special of metal, is, uh, is not trivial. So it all starts with material science. So today, today, you have the chance to create new alloys. Yes, in the past, an engineer was bound to the existing materials, right? When I went to university, they taught me, okay, first thing that you have to do, you have to choose your material. And then you have homogeneous mechanical properties. And then you have to live with it. Or you go back to the drawing table and you choose a different material. Now, today, engineers do not need to select material. They can define, they can design their own materials. They can take uh, titanium, aluminum, and put iron, carbon fiber, and they can put all together to create a whole new material. But this is not trivial. So what happens when you put together, when you do sinterization with the particles of different materials? Many things can happen. Uh, for instance, you can have a phenomenon like a globalization, phenomenon, phenomenon like uh, lamina, lamination. This is, this is, these are real, real life examples. So if you are not uh, fully into the science, the atomic structure of your material, you cannot be successful in a 3D printing strategy. So you need to know all these things, all the way from the atomic substructure to the microstructure, all the way to the macrostructure. But you know, I have good news. All of this can be simulated. All the science and technology that goes into the process of 3D printing can be simulated today and can avoid very costly mistakes. And this is the simulation of the sintering process. Related to the 3D printing is a this extraordinary ability that you have to create shapes that were not possible before. Just look at this connection for a bicycle or a motorcycle. This type of structure cannot be designed today with sketch and extrude, right? This is called lattice structure. The only way to manufacture this type of structure can be through 3D printing. And in addition, this cannot be designed with traditional techniques, techniques as I was saying. You need an algorithm to design these complex, uh, these complex shapes and uh, a different mathematical technology. But I have uh, more good news for you. All of this can be done today by the software that we are giving to all our engineers in our ecosystem. This is what happening. This is what will be coming into our portfolio. It started already, is not very far in the future. I think I want to close with another amazing example of uh, the future of design. This is a, an air duct that is completely designed by a computer. Now, an air duct, the fundamental job of an air duct is to divert fluid with a minimal loss of pressure. And the computer is able to tell you what is the optimal shape to minimize the loss of pressure between inlet and outlet. And look at that. And, and then you can simulate it to see if the prediction was correct. And you can even compare the design done without and with the topology optimization. Like in this case, on the left, you see a part not, not optimized, and on the right, you see the optimized part. On the left, you see a lot of recirculation, and the pressure drop, I think, was in this case, um, I don't remember the percentage, but there was a significant improve, improvement in, the, in percentage of efficiency. I think it was about 20%. Can you imagine the 20% improvement just by using simulation? I think it's uh, pretty amazing what the future of technology is uh, reserving for all of us. So this is my last slide. Thank you for your attention. I probably spoke too much, but uh, I hope I have conveyed to you <laughs> exciting is, things that are coming along. Gian Paolo is very enthusiastic about SolidWorks and what he has to offer his customers. And we so appreciate the fact that he came and, and joined us this evening. 
And I want to check to see if anybody has any questions before we let him go. He's in Boston, so it's late where he's at. Not too late, Elise, not too late. <laughs> Don't want to keep him up too much past his bedtime. He's a busy guy. <laughs> so um, does anybody have any questions before we let Giampaolo go? That was an amazing presentation, Giampaolo. Thank you, Elise. But in any case, uh, if any questions uh, comes, come, comes up, uh, even in the future, you know how to find me, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can track you down. Any, anybody have any questions for Giampaolo before we um, turn the mic over to Mike? Um, I just have one question. Uh, you, you, you talked a lot about um, integration with uh, using the, the uh, cloud services. Um, it is, I mean, I assume that a lot of, uh, like defense contractor companies like, uh, Raytheon or, you know, General Electric or, you know, Lockheed all use SolidWorks as well. How, um, w are there any uh, significant security issues with, um, uh, moving to cloud-based services, uh, with something that's so rife for being, you know, for espionage? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. A good, very good question. And I, I hear this question a lot. But uh, I can tell you that times are changing and very rapidly. In fact, I, I asked this question a few years back. I was talking to a very large manufacturer in, uh, in Europe. Very large company, German company. You know, Germans are very conservative. And uh, I was, they were curious about our cloud strategy. They wanted to talk about cloud strategy. And I was not uh, ready to talk about cloud because I was uh, under the assumption that a very large uh, company, German, was a little bit conservative, not very much interested in, in cloud technologies yet. So I was a little bit surprised. I said, okay, I can talk about our cloud strategy, but uh, would you be interested? Don't you think uh, that the cloud is more vulnerable than on-premise technology. And then, uh, and then this, uh, this gentleman, the senior VP, he said, you know, Gianpaolo, uh, we learned that uh, a company like Google spends uh, two or three billion dollars a year in security systems. And Google could not exist if security was not under control in every second of their life. You know, we are a very large company, but we could never, ever afford that type of investment in, in security. So they say, I believe that my secrets, my company secrets are safer on a Google Vault than in my own, uh, in my own data warehouse. And uh, so I was, uh, that thing was, uh, was struck me. But I can tell you that uh, I can see also here in the US, uh, the military, is opening, is defining the standards for cloud deployment. And uh, especially for the military, uh, at the end of the story, the internet was born in the military environment because of the flexibility and the resilience of the internet. So it is inconceivable that they cannot, they don't, they are not thinking on how to fully exploiting it. In fact, there are protocols and there are safety protocols and safety standards that are designed to be deployed on the, on the cloud. And today, aerospace companies are uh, slowly, slowly ad adapting, uh, uh, adopting uh, cloud technology, slowly but uh, securely. Because at the end of the story, those giants, uh, those giants uh, uh, infrastructure provider are uh, investing billion like Microsoft, Google, IBM are investing billion and billion of dollars uh, in security. There is uh, this uh, new things based on uh, uh, new technologies based on quantum computing. I mean, there will be there will be breakthrough very soon by which uh, internet transactions will be very very safe. At the end of the story, the entire financial system lives uh, in the cloud. And, and, and as you know, okay, there are uh, security issues every now and then. We know that, you know, a few credit cards get stolen. Those things will, will fade away. I believe uh, even uh, large defense contractors will use this technology because it's, uh, I mean, the advantage, the flexibility, the cost reduction is huge. In the meantime, uh, we, I can tell you that uh, SolidWorks and the system, 
is ready and able to deploy on-premise all these technologies. Because there are so-called the private clouds that are useful as well. So there are companies that say, okay, I don't want to go in the public cloud, but I like the, the flexibility, the power, the fact that everything is concentrated, there are a few servers, you can control, nothing is deployed on the periphery. So we have the ability to deploy uh, cloud, private cloud as well. 